Hi. Welcome everyone to Diabetes Etiquette, Supporting Your Loved Ones with Diabetes with Dr. Bill Polonsky, founder and president of the Behavioral Diabetes Institute. I'm Lynn with Taking Control of Your Diabetes. Um, my husband has type one, so I'm also a type three like many of you. I just wanna remind everyone to please feel free to use the chat box to communicate with other attendees. And if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A box and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the talk. Thanks so much. Take it away, Bill. Hey, thanks, Lynn. And I'm so glad that you're here, Lynn, because you're going to represent everybody listening, because we're here to talk to folks who have type 3 diabetes. So let me share my screen, and I'm going to bring up some slides for a while, and hopefully you will be able to see them quite well. Uh, hopefully you're seeing them, Lynn. Yes? Yeah. Good. All right. So we're here to talk about some of the important issues for those of you who are caregivers, loved ones of people with diabetes. You could be spouses or parents or partners or, well, or just be someone who cares about someone who has diabetes type one or type two. So let's start at the beginning. You're here to listen and interact with us. Why on earth are you even here right now? So here's my best guess, given that we've discussed this topic and presented this for actually many years and decades. We know some of the possible reasons are you here because you actually care about someone who has diabetes and you want to help? Um, some of you are here because you're just guilt-ridden. You feel like, oh my God, I should be involved. I should be engaged more. I should be helping my partner, my kid, whoever, my friend in some way. And you know, uh, you just feel bad. You're not doing enough. Some of you are just frustrated and angry that what is wrong with my loved one with, with diabetes? Why aren't they doing a better job and you're just so annoyed with them and you just, nothing you do seems to work, doesn't seem to make a difference, or maybe you're just sitting silently, you don't know what to say. Um, or finally, at the very bottom of the slide, you might be just wondering, maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I should be more involved. Maybe I should be more engaged. So we wanna look at some of those issues. So let's back up and start at the beginning and say, look, here's some of the things we should all agree on when it comes to it. So we know that living with a disease like diabetes um, is a job, right? It's a job that your loved one didn't volunteer for. There was no pay, there's no vacations, you get to do it forever. And when we think about the, the work of diabetes, I mean, diabetes to a large degree, it really is a behavioral issue, right? It's stuff you gotta do every day. Um, and when we, what we know as myself, as a psychologist, um, what we've learned over the past few decades, if you really want to help people be successful with making positive behavior changes over time, one of the things that works really, really well is when you have people in your life who care about you, who are rooting for you in any possible way. So people have people who, who are supporting them. And it could be humans, it could be animals, it could be just about anyone. So when we think about though, separate from the person with diabetes, when we think about those of you who care about someone with diabetes, I also recognize, as I'm sure you do as well, that this is not easy. I mean, you're often really in what seems like an impossible situation. Um, you may be, like we see for a lot of folks, especially a lot of partners and spouses, you kind of know you maybe you're being, you're too much of a nag, you're sort of pestering your loved one too much, and you kind of want to stop, but you feel like, well, maybe, but you dare not. If you don't, if you, if you stop pestering them, then you're not caring enough. Um, or maybe you're in this other situation, which is the second bullet point on this slide, where your partner may want different things from you that's kind of confusing, right? Like how many times you may have heard, as we hear often from our loved ones who have diabetes, which is like, look, leave me alone. We don't we shouldn't make a big deal out of my diabetes, okay? I, I've got this. Um, just treat me like anybody else. Just ignore it. But also, I want you to make a big deal out of this and recognize that this is a this sucks and this is hard for me and I could use a little extra help sometimes. So don't bother me, and you should help me and bother me, which can leave you kind of going, well, how do I deal with all that? So again, you're someone who cares about someone with diabetes. And we know you have lots of feelings. Your loved one with diabetes may be doing things that you're thinking are not like the making the best behavioral choices when it comes to managing their diabetes well. And should you be quiet? Should you say something? Can you say anything that isn't gonna make things worse? 
Um, it's very common to see this in all aspects of diabetes, probably more even in type 2 diabetes. Now, for those of you who care about someone who has type 1 diabetes, you may have these issues and more because you may be really worried about hypoglycemia. And if you're a loved one with someone with hypoglycemia, you may be especially worried at night. In fact, what's really remarkable, and no one talks about this, is how many, especially spouses and partners of adults with type 1 diabetes, and parents too, really have fairly profound insomnia. It's hard to sleep through the night because you can be so concerned and so worried. So when you care about someone, realize that you're in a difficult, if not an impossible situation. So again, I wanna be clear about what that situation is and how you're trying to find some way to navigate this. On the one hand, you don't wanna be a nag. You don't wanna be saying, why don't you treat that low better? Why don't you stop eating all that crappy stuff? It's difficult, but you kind of want to do something. On the other hand, you don't want to just abandon your loved one with diabetes, say, well, good luck, it's all yours. I'm just going to ignore everything you're doing and I hope things work out for you. So you're trying to find that little circle in between being a nag and just abandoning the individual, which means you're trying to help. So that's what you want to think about. Now what we know, even though you may have the best of intentions, maybe some of you've got this figured out, but many of you feel like despite your best efforts, you may accidentally have become a true expert at negative caregiving. And this happens really coming from a place of love. And if you've ever heard me or Dr. Elman or other of our colleagues here at TCOAD talking about this, you know we've tried to address this issue before because it's so common. And really one of the issues that emerges is what we call the issue of the diabetes police. And the diabetes police are usually, again, loved ones of people with diabetes who have decided somewhere along the line that God has deputized them to help the person with diabetes manage the disease, whether you like it or not. That can lead to problems, right? So we know some of the common sayings of the diabetes police, like, honey, should you be eating that? Or dear, you seem a little upset maybe you should check your blood sugars. And by the way, you may have noticed that when you actually say this to your loved one, often there's a pretty immediate response of, I'm fine, okay? Or actually something worse than I'm fine. Another common saying of the diabetes police, you know, your blood sugars are high again. What did you do wrong this time? Now again, we know that for those of you who are caregivers and you end up being diabetes policemen, 99% of the time, you're coming from a place of love. You just care. It may not be coming across correctly. And that's really the issue. Because if you, despite your best efforts, are being a nag or being perceived as being a nag, even if that's not really what you're doing, it's common for the person with diabetes to respond to that by deciding to stand up for their own independence, his or her independence. That's what any of us would do. If you feel like you're being bugged, you want the other individual to know that, no, I'm, I'm a grown-up here, or maybe not a grown-up. I can take care of this myself. And a response, in response, the person with diabetes just having to decide the best way to do that, the best way to stand up for your independence, at least the most immediate way, is to do the exact opposite of whatever is being asked. And the result of that usually is in response to feeling like you're, you've got a diabetes policeman in your house, is that you become a diabetes criminal right? You don't think I should be eating this? Yeah. Watch me. Oh, you think I should check my blood sugars now? It's the last thing I'm going to be doing. There's sort of this immediate response that any of us would do, and it's perfectly understandable. And that's the problem, because everybody means well, right? You may be, you as a loved one may be offering help in some way that's not coming across right, and the person is responding as it best they can. We end up driving ourselves crazy. So, let me just stop for a minute. Lynn, what do you think? How am I doing? Is this okay? Great. No, you're spot on. Totally spot on. I know, I know you would never, ever do anything like this. Never. You chime in if you, if you think this is a, a think what to do. But we know, by the way, that you end up with unnecessarily, there's a lot of unhelpful things that a loved one can do. And Lynn, by the way, is someone who would never, ever do any of this. Um, for example, uh, maybe you should try to convince your loved one that terrible things will happen if they don't take better care of their diabetes. You're going to lose your leg. You're going to end up on dialysis. 
Uh, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare providers do this. Um, or maybe uh, other unhelpful things is giving your partner advice they didn't ask for, right? Like, oh my God, you're really high. We need to do something about this right now. Like, as if I didn't know I was already really high. Um, so it's easy to especially be offering advice that hasn't been requested, and that's where things really get difficult. So what we want to think about is some of the positive approaches. And actually, I, I interrupted my trying to ask Lynn some questions. Before we talk about the positive approaches, Lynn, um, any thoughts about just some of the stuff that we've talked about so far, about how even despite your best efforts, you can end up in conflict with your loved one? Does that ever yeah, happen to you? Well, and sometimes things that happen with me personally is that I, in, like in, in the moment of if there is like a, a low blood sugar or something that happens, like I think normally I'm doing pretty good, but then if something does happen and I'm sort of, un, and it's unexpected, I react before I remember what I need, I need to rein it what? in and then present it in a way that's hopefully going to be kind. But, it, but I think what you just said is important. You can have sort of this immediate response, sometimes because you're scared or annoyed or something, and it just comes out. Right. So, um, and that's, if that ever happens to any of you who are watching right now, yeah, welcome to the club, right? We know how common this is. So let's turn this around and think about some of the helpful things you can do. Some of the things that, you know, we've heard from some, from the folks that we've talked to over the years. One lady said to me, you know, I make a point of celebrating with my loved one whenever I catch him making a smart choice. And you got to do this with sincerity and you don't want to be patronizing, but to celebrate together. Um, now, sticking with that first bullet point, by the way, we are um, uh, just getting ready to publish some results where we look at what happens to um, people who have the uh, uh, Dexcom share platform. So they have a, a continuous glucose monitor and their partner as real time can see their numbers on their phone. And how do you deal? I mean, Lynn, you probably know you share with your husband. How do you deal with having all those numbers? What do you say? And we've discovered that one of the things that seems to be most critical and crucial, we'll talk about some of the others, is when you can do a good job, not just of critiquing or pointing out what things are going wrong, but pointing out when things are going right. Like, wow, you've had an awesome day. Congratulations, this is great. Let's go eat a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> um, so, but this celebration part is really key and it's easy to forget about that, I think. Lynn, you look like you're gonna say something about that. I need to remember that so, so much more um, because you know I, I feel like my husband is really great you know, at, at um, managing his diabetes and I forget to um, acknowledge the hard work that goes into it and when he does have great days and that's super important. I need to remember to do that more often for sure. Yeah, and thank you. And, and I think that's captured in the next bullet point that one of someone else told us. He said, you know, I try not to make a big deal out of our sugars when they're wacky. This is someone who actually ha was uh, on the Dexcom share platform. He was seeing his wife's data you know, instead, he said, I let her know that I appreciate all of her hard work. So he was seeing all these crazy numbers going on. He made a point of saying, I'm glad you're hanging in there. You know, just finding some way to, if you can't celebrate the numbers, at least saying, congratulating on, I'm glad you haven't thrown this meter away. <laughs> you know, like, um, anyway, but... Um, and then finally, the, someone else said, you can see the last bullet point at the bottom said, you know, rather than offering any more dumb, and void, dumb advice, I decided that I'd better get informed. So this person said, you know what? I'd like to go to a diabetes education program, like TCOID actually, and do it together with their partner. And this was really helpful because this person realized they were making all sorts of suggestions, worrying about things where they didn't really know what they were talking about. So again, for those of you who are type threes, you're here because you care about someone who has diabetes and it's your first time at a TCOID, I'm so glad you're here. This is great. Um, so when we think about what to do, I wanna to move to the subject of the title of this talk, which is about etiquette. So many of you know, there's a lot of things written about etiquette, some starting with Emily Post many years ago. In fact, one of my favorite more recent books on this topic is this book, Etiquette for Dummies. Now we're not going to talk about, go into the details of this book. I think I like showing the, pic, the front of this book. It's a real book just because I think it's amazing. There's a book called Etiquette for Dummies. I mean, who buys this book? Does someone go to a bookstore and say, 
let's see, I'm an idiot. I have no etiquette. That's the book for me. Maybe this is more of a Christmas stocking stuffer. <laughs> hint, hint for other people. So we know there's a lot on etiquette, but there's actually not a lot about diabetes etiquette. So that's what I want to address with you now. So when we talk about diabetes etiquette, it means the rules for proper behavior for people with diabetes and their loved ones. And we think there are these rules. And by sharing these rules, this might allow a more positive conversation to begin. So at where I work at the Behavioral Diabetes Institute, we first focused this for on adults with diabetes. So we were, we do a lot of group or we're doing a lot of group programs for people, especially adults with diabetes. And we would ask them, what drives you crazy about diabetes? What, what is the things that are really making this hard for you? And there was always a short list of important issues, but usually about number three or four on the list was this. They'd say, you know what drives me crazy? It's all the annoying, stupid things other people say to me. And I just want to strangle them sometimes or run away. And that's where we got this idea. We said, well, maybe there should be like a little etiquette booklet. And so we actually developed a first draft, a first edition. This is, so this is a little tiny booklet. It's actually a little accordion card that rolls like this. And the idea is, let me back up for a minute. Again, this is, we would give this, we still do to the people with diabetes so they can give it to their loved ones. Because again, as you can see by the title, it's diabetes etiquette for people who don't have diabetes. So we would give this to individuals with diabetes and say, look, next time someone says something annoying or stupid to you, rather than just punching them or yelling at them, you can just politely say, oh, um, you must not know the rules about how to behave. And you can just very politely give them the diabetes etiquette card. Now, these rules are not perfect, but th the point of the card was to hopefully open a conversation between the person with diabetes and the individuals in their lives. And by the way, these are available for free. You can download them. We've also developed diabetes etiquette for parents. So the idea was this is for teenagers for di with diabetes to give to their parents. Um, so this, uh, some of the items are, uh, the rules are similar, some different. Probably the most different one is, I think it's number three that says, um, mom and dad, um, when we meet someone new, could you wait at least 60 seconds before telling them I have diabetes? That'd be very helpful. Um, so, um, and you can find copies for all these right on our website. This is just at behavioraldiabetes.org. And you'll see a place where you can see a PDF. It'll come out as a sheet though. It won't come out as these pretty accordion cards, which um, we do charge for because we have to if we're gonna uh, print them and mail them. But you can just print out for free, just copies of any of the etiquette cards at all. So let's put all this together now. Here's a take home message. The bottom line is this, this interpersonal side of diabetes we know is really important. When you have a cheerleader in your life, people do better. People do better in making any kind of positive behavior change. And we have decades of data show that people with diabetes are more successful and feel better with in terms of managing their diabetes when they have folks in their lives who are cheerleading or rooting for them in the right way. But in the right way is depending on between you and your loved one because everybody is going to be different. None of us are experts. So therefore, the most important thing to do is make it possible for you and your loved ones to have an open conversation about, first of all, how you might be driving each other crazy about talking about diabetes or living together with diabetes and bringing up this second, the last point of this slide, which is, how can you work together better? What's your role gonna be? And it's having that conversation. And by the way, you wanna have that conversation at a dispassionate moment, right? You don't wanna wait for the time when everybody's infuriated or your loved one has a blood glucose level of 45, okay? You want a nice, quiet, dispassionate moment to have this conversation. So the goal is we wanna help those of you type threes, those of you who are caregivers, not feel so exhausted and beaten down by your worries about diabetes, but hopefully feeling engaged and a, a real team member and feeling positive and good about this. So that's what I wanted to say. I wanna thank you for this. And now we have time for your thoughts and questions. And before your questions, I'm gonna ask Lynn. Lynn, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I mean, you're really, everything resonated with me. Um, it's, and it, and it is different for different people, obviously, but 
Um, it's just all great reminders for me personally. Um, because sometimes you just, you get into your day to day and you are chugging along and you just kind of, you know, need those reminders to check in, to have conversations. In fact, one of the questions that we did get is one of mine, but I didn't ask it, but it's the same. Um, it says, I worry about how if my loved one became really incapacitated, how I would manage all of his electronic systems since I'm not as familiar with all of it the way he is. And, you know, that's something that I, I have frequently thought about too. I really have, I don't, I mean, I need to have more knowledge about how it all works. And, you know, something that I've thought about on my to-do list is just to have that conversation with him, have him show me how it all works. Um, I'm not good with math, so I think I would be a terrible <laughs> person to help with carb counting, et cetera, bolusing. But, you know, that's something I worry about too. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I wonder what the person means by incapacitated, right? So, yeah, I mean, we know that your loved one, if they've been living with diabetes for quite a while, they're really good at this. I mean, Lynn, I know your husband, he's awesome at this, right? And yeah, neither you nor me are ever going to be that good. So what is it we want to be good at? I mean, you're not, we're not going to be able to take over his care or her care. Um, you want to be able to deal with something if they have a severe low. So of course, hopefully you've been hearing today about you know, some of the new glucagon products that can really make a difference so that you can serve as the rescuer, right? And we know that's so much easier now if, you're, if, you're, if your loved one ends up unconscious or, you know, with a seizure or something like that. As rare as that might be, we know that's a concern. So the most important thing I can say is to do what you're going to do, Lynn, at some point, which is you want to have that conversation with your loved one about, let's talk about it. What am I going to, what do you want me to do if X happens? And being prepared is the best thing. There's no easy common answer for everybody that would allow me to answer that any better than have that conversation. Right. And I think, you know, I may, again, you know, on the, on the rainy day to-do list, but maybe I need to bump it up to a sunny day to-do list, but is um, have contact numbers for, you know, his pump people and his Dexcom people and, you know, any other customer support people in an easy to find spot just so that I can have that ready if, you know, God forbid I need it, but just, it might help calm me down a little bit just to have some plans in place. Um, yeah. And I don't think it would be a whole page too. I think. It'd yeah. Be a whole page. yeah. 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 So make, make that list with them. I think that's a great idea. Um, okay. So here's another question that came in. I'd be curious to get some insight to good ways to be supportive when my spouse is treating a low. I often find myself being nervous and waiting it out, um, getting sugar, but I'd like to be able to do more. Um, yeah, well, again, I'm going to be really boring here, but the most helpful thing you can do is ask your partner, not while they're low, ask your partner in advance, tell me what, what would be the most helpful thing I can do if I see that you're getting low or, or if I see and or that you're even treating that low, what's the best thing for me to do? We do know, uh, I mean, this, uh, this is a big source of conflict often with, with um, partners. And I, I think I've probably had a uh, hundred couples in my office where I end up serving as umpire, watching them argue it out. And what's remarkable is they all end up coming to the same solution over and over and over again, um, but they just need to make sure it's said out loud. And so they, let me turn this, sorry about this. It, the, the result, the, it's usually something like this, like um, if you see that I'm getting low and I don't seem to be responding to that low, um, let's set up some sort of signal, usually nonverbal, and knowing that in advance, as long as you don't say anything, I promise to follow that signal. So the most common one is the partner who says, let's agree that um, if I think you're getting, or let me say the person with diabetes is, if you think I'm getting a low and you put a glass of juice in front of me and don't say anything, I promise to drink it. Because where typically we get in trouble is when you say something, mm -hmm. right? So I'm already low, my blood sugar's below, 70 or below 55. I'm not thinking clearly, but I know how to push back. So, and if someone gets in your face and says, are you low? Right. We know the instant response a hundred percent of the time is I'm fine. Even if you're not fine, you're going to say it. So 
you need ahead of time sort of that have a sort of almost like a, a signal process. Um, but it, yeah. doing that ahead of time with your partner is probably these, especially if they have type one, I, it's probably the single most important thing you can do. Mm-hmm. That's a great idea. Um, so do you I have that with your partner, by the way? I need to. <laughs> I need to. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm writing my own to-do list as we go through this. <laughs> um, so I'm not entirely sure what this person is asking, but the question is, how do you deal with information overload from the person with diabetes over a long period? So I'm not sure if that's so much information, just diabetes can be so complex um, and it gets overwhelming. Not entirely sure. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I respond to that because I'm not sure what it means. Yeah. I may, maybe this person can sit right in and say a little more. I, I mean, I guess what goes through my head, if, if again, if we're talking about type one diabetes, maybe it's someone who's um, as Dexcom share and is seeing all this data coming and what do I do with all this information? Yeah. Um, we, we've talked a lot, by the way, of hopefully putting together a little etiquette booklet just for share users, by the way, like what's the best way to respond if I'm sitting on my own phone and I see my partner's data all the time. And, and again, the most important thing is just to ask your partner what they want. Um, usually, the, usually it's, I can tell you the most common response that we've heard, and a lot of this early work we did together with Carrie Sparling, who some of you have already heard here at TCY today, and you'll hear her later, because she's gonna wrap things up for us. The most common thing I think we heard from folks is, if you see that I'm going low, or actually, if you see am I going low or high, here's the first thing, never ask me why. Mm. Like, well, why? What'd you do wrong? Why? <laughs> that is 100% of the time, never helpful. So, um, but anyway, maybe this person will tell us a little more what they mean by overload. Yeah, if we get more information for sure, we will um, revisit. Um, and then another question about, um, do you have any suggestions, and you may have touched on this a little bit already, but on how to help your spouse or child when they're just having a, I'm just so tired of diabetes moment. Yeah, wow, thank you. What a wonderful question. Um, well, let me acknowledge that it happens. Uh, that there's one thing I'm probably well known for is the concept of what's called diabetes burnout. And that what your kid goes through is, I think the most important thing to tell your child is that they're normal. And that anyone on the planet who was given a job like diabetes, where there is no pay, no vacations, do it for the rest of your life. If you have, if you're hired to do a job like that, you are going to get tired of it, right? When there's no weekends and there's no vacations you are gonna get tired of it. So the most important thing is to acknowledge this, yeah, you get sick and tired of it. And we actually think it's most important to help people to, what we, to actually have time off. Like, and so for you as a mom or a dad, to be able to say, how can I help you have a break? You know, I don't think not taking your insulin for a few weeks is a good idea. We know that it's a dirty little secret about diabetes, that everybody does take time off from their diabetes to keep your sanity. But there are unsafe ways to do that. And there are safe ways to do that. Having little mini breaks or saying, you know what, why don't you check my blood sugars for a while? I'm not going to think about it for the next couple hours or the next day. Or, you know, we need to have a pig out night where I'm not going to be thinking at all about carbohydrates. Yeah, good for you. You don't have to manage diabetes perfectly, perfectly anyway. And no one is able to. So how do you find some compromise between doing your job, the job of diabetes as well as you can, and having a break? Everyone needs to find that compromise point. And you as a parent or any as a loved one can be supportive of that. It's finding that compromise point that we're always saying we want people to talk about that with their physician, their other healthcare providers as well, to find some point of comfort about that. Um, so I'm really glad you asked that question and I just hope you let your kid know that they're normal and say, how can I help you have a, a break that will be safe? Let's talk about it. Yeah, that's awesome. So we did have a few other questions, which we will, we can, I do want to wrap up and give people a little bit of time to take a breather before the next lecture starts in a few minutes. Um, so any unanswered questions we will, um, we will answer off the broadcast and repost on our website. Um, so thank you, Bill. That was super helpful as always. Just such great information, good reminders and tips. Um, you know, we're all in this 
we're all in it together, whether we have it or we are care for someone who does. Yeah. Um, and if we can take the edge off a little bit to help make their lives a little bit easier, then it's, you know, good for everybody. Thank you again so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.